Welcome to the Hopwa CV Timely Expenditure of Fund Sessions of the National CARES Act Training Conference. Before we get into the content of our session, we need to do some housekeeping. Like other Hopwa webinars, this PowerPoint presentation and webinar recording will be available on the HUD exchange in the near future. Participants will be in listen only mode. You have the ability to enable closed captions. Just look for the show captions button below the video player. And please feel free to consult the attendee guide for more information. This is available on the resources page of the event website. If you have any technical issues, please request assistance using the chat box to the right side of the screen. Also, you can submit questions related to technical issues to this email address. You could submit your content related questions using the Q&A feature located below the video player. Feel free to submit your questions as they occur to you throughout the presentation, although we likely won't respond to them until the end of the presentation. If you would like to access questions while simultaneously viewing the event without having to scroll down, you can download the Slido app on your phone and then try the, uh, type in the code for this session. And the support team is posting the Slido code for this session in the chat. You can also scroll to the bottom of the page to find the Slido code in the session description. Your presenters today from Collaborative Solutions are myself, Kate Rudell, Crystal Pope, Emily Fishbein and Christine Campbell. And from the Office of HIV AIDS Housing, we're joined by the director, Rita Harcrow, and the deputy director, Amy Palalonis. This session is intended to review the purpose of the CARES Act funding and to address the timely and appropriate spend down of the HOPWA CV funds. We will cover CV funding, waivers and program flexibilities, the importance of timely spending, FY22 allocation projections and the impact on budgets, and some strategies for grantee budgeting, planning, and spending. Before we dig into the content of this session, I'd like to turn it over to Rita Harcrow, the Director of the Office of HIV AIDS Housing, to say a few words of welcome. Rita? Hi, thanks, Kate. Um, I just wanna say welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining today. And I was thinking it's hard to imagine that we're almost two years into this pandemic and about the same amount of time into the CARES Act grant awards. When the pandemic first happened in March, 2020, I don't know about you, but I was thinking, um, we'll be back to normal in a few weeks and then uh, we'll be back to normal in a few months. Um, and yet here we are uh, almost two years later, still struggling under the weight of this pandemic and my hat is off to you all uh, who are continuing the work every day uh, to help people living with HIV have safe uh, and affordable housing as the month, months go on and on. We see you. Uh, and the goal of this webinar is really to try to give a fresh spin on the ways to utilize HOPA CARES Act funds um, that you might have remaining uh, and, and continue to try to help you plan for the unknowns as we all are. Uh, again, I just thank you uh, for joining, and now I will turn the session back over to Kate. Thank you, Rita. All right, so let's begin with a brief overview of the CARES Act funds, activities, and purpose. The CARES Act was signed into law on March 27, 2020. $65 million in supplemental funding was appropriated for HOPWA in order to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus. 53.7 million was granted to formula grantees following the same uh, formula used to determine their FY 2020 allocations. $10 million in one-time non-renewable funding was granted to competitive grantees proportionate to their existing grants. This award is a one-time award with a three-year period of performance beginning on the date of the, uh, the grantees signed their grant agreement or their award. Each grantee has multiple options in providing COVID-19 related activities. Formula grantees have access to CARES Act funding, FY20 funds that are designated for COVID-19 in their uh, annual action plan, and regular formula HOPWA awards. Competitive grantees have only one HOPWA funding stream designated for COVID-19 activities, which is their CARES Act funding. Competitive grantees will continue to implement their current 
a grants as approved and may make use of any existing waivers. So how does HUD expect these HOPWA CARES Act funds to be used? Well, CARES Act funds are additional funds to prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID-19 beginning in 2020. Funds can be used to provide any HOPWA eligible activities provided they are in your approved action plans and competitive grant agreements. And grantees must use these funds to provide activities that are consistent with their community needs for COVID-19 preparedness and response. So let's talk about some CARES Act program supports, waivers, and some additional program flexibilities. The CARES Act, the Hopwell CARES Act notice, and a series of waivers and waiver extensions contain provisions intended to assist Hopwell programs to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and to mitigate against the serious economic impact caused by COVID-19 for eligible households. In addition, OHH approved new temporary program flexibilities for certain HOPWA activities carried out during the pandemic. The HOPWA CARES Act notice, notice CPD 2005, provided more information about activities specifically related to COVID-19, including admin costs, which were increased to 6% for grantees and 10% for sponsors. Sturbu limits were increased to up to 24 months with CARES Act funds. Stays at hotels, motels, and other locations to quarantine HOPWA eligible individuals or their family, non HIV positive family members, including households that currently reside in HOPWA subsidized units. Transportation services, including costs for privately owned vehicle transportation to access medical care, supplies, and food, or to commute to places of employment. Accessing essential services like water, food, medications, medical care, and information. Nutrition services like grocery and meal deliveries and food banks. Educating households about COVID-19 to reduce the risk of getting sick or spreading COVID. And costs related to infection control, such as cleaning and disinfectant supplies, gloves, and other safety-related products for uh, staff and assisted households. It allowed the grantee to designate a portion of their FY20 funds in their annual action plan for COVID-19 response. And it also addressed how grantees need to prevent duplication of benefits, which we'll discuss a little bit later. Waivers were made available to provide additional support to programs to carry out their HOPWA activities during the pandemic. These included self-certification of income and credible HIV information. It allowed households to rent above the rent standard if the rent was still reasonable, allowed for a delay in initial unit inspections or for remote inspection methods. It provided for use of alternative spaces for housing and shelter. It allowed for up to 12 months of STRMU assistance in a 12 month period on a case by case basis with regular HOPWA funds. And it allowed for an increase for short term supported housing units up to 120 days in a six month period. To date, HUD has issued two mega waivers and three waiver extensions that contain provisions for the HOPLA program. In order to utilize any of these waivers, grantees are required to notify their field office about their intent to do so, including any extensions of waivers. So this slide contains information on the waiver extensions as of December 30th, 2021. As you can see, the self-certification of income and HIV status ended on September 30th. The FMR standard for HOPWA has been extended until March 31st, 2022, as has the property standards for initial inspections. Please be reminded that those units that were initially waived or inspected remotely must be physically re-inspected by June 30th. And the HOPWA space and security also ends on March 31st. And please note that the time limit for short-term housing facilities and STRMU ended at the end of the calendar year. The Office of Age of AIDS Housing approved new temporary program flexibilities for certain HOPWA activities carried out during the pandemic. And some examples include allowance for the purchase of gift cards for food and gas, car repairs, using um, FY20 funds designated for uh, COVID response or CARES Act funds only, a delayed annual reinspections, 
um, hotel motel room damages, again, using CARES Act or um, 2020 funds designated for CARES Act activities only. And project sponsors could use PHP and STRMU in combination, provided that at least one of those activities is CARES Act funded. Resources and more information is available on the HUD exchange through the links on this slide. As promised, here's more information about the duplication of benefits. HOPWA CV funds are subject to the duplication of benefits requirements as outlined in the HOPWA CARES Act notice, notice CPD 2005. There is a duplication of benefits quick guide on the HUD exchange. Now I'm going to turn it over to Crystal Pope. Thank you, Kate. So the remainder of our session today is focused on the spend down of HOPWA CARES Act funds, also touching on other unspent and anticipated funds and planning to ensure that the continued needs of people living with HIV during the pandemic are being met. So when spending down CARES Act funds, while spending down the actual funds is important, it's not all about the money, but about making sure that the funds are spent without delay on activities that address the most pressing needs of our clients right now and going forward. Let's look specifically at HOPWA CARES Act funding first. There are four overarching goals HUD would like you to keep in mind as you continue to provide support to HOPWA eligible households. First, make sure that you're minimizing any barriers or delays in getting assistance to HOPWA eligible households. This should always be a goal for HOPWA programs and is even more important considering the danger of COVID-19 to people with HIV. Do a quick audit of your procedures to make sure you know about anything that may be causing delays. Second, the goal is to make any needed adjustments in your budgeted activities to target the greatest current needs. That's something that most programs do on an annual basis, but this is a much more dynamic time right now in, in terms of making those adjustments to what's being provided. Third, we want to ensure that HAPA eligible households become and remain stably housed. This remains an important goal as always. And also we wanna do the best job possible of keeping clients, uh, of helping clients understand COVID-19 safety measures, which is really no small feat as the guidance keeps changing and, and evolving. I know we've all experienced that. And at this point, information on and access to vaccinations and testing is also very important. In summary, there are many reasons why it's important to spend COPPA CV funds in a timely manner, most related to ensuring the safety and health of our clients. But we're also concerned, uh, have to be concerned about how slow spending of these important funds may send the wrong message. Um, and I'm just going to ask Amy Palolonis from OHH to address this uh, briefly. Sure. Uh, thanks, Crystal. And hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to uh, you know, state that it's incredibly important that grantees work to ensure that their CV grant funds are expended in a timely manner. Um, and as Crystal mentioned, in a way that meets the needs of eligible households. When grant funds are left on the table, it can signal to Congress that funds for this population aren't needed uh, when we all know that that is not true. Uh, all funds that are recaptured at the end of the three-year period of performance will not be repurposed in the HOPWA program to serve people living with HIV. Uh, they will be returned to the Treasury to be used for something else. So it is extremely important that these grants are fully expended within um, three-year period of performance um, in a manner that is responsive to the needs of low-income people living with HIV in your communities. Great, thanks, Amy. So uh, let's look at how grantees are currently doing on spend down of CARES Act funds. Kate, uh, will you review the next couple of slides and talk about what this looks like right now? Sure, thanks, Crystal. So the Office of HIV AIDS Housing monitors the draws of CARES Act funds on a weekly basis. 
And if you're a grantee that generally only draws quarterly, you may wanna increase your draw frequency to show HUD that you're actually spending your CARES Act funds. As of January 4th, here's the status of formula grantee draws from IDIS. As you can see, 8% of grantees have drawn zero CARES Act funds. 24% of formula grantees have drawn one to 25%, 12 have drawn 25 to 50%, 20% have drawn 51 to 75%, 24% have drawn 76 to 99%, and only 12% of formula grantees have drawn 100% of their CARES Act funds. When we move on to the competitive grantees, the picture is kind of similar. So 5% have drawn 0% of their funds, 32% have drawn up to 25%, 25% have drawn up to 50%, 18% have drawn almost three quarters of their award, 11% have drawn up to 99%, and 9% have drawn up to 100% of it, I'm sorry, have drawn 100% of their funds. So when we look at them together, we can see that grantees have already, um, they've all received their awards. So 100% of the CARES funds awards have been awarded to grantees. 91% of folks have made at least one drawdown. On the formula side, 46% of those funds have been drawn. That's about $24.5 million. A similar proportion, 45%, have been dispersed from um, Treasury or IDA, yes, or ELOGs um, from the competitive grantees at $4.2 million. And to translate those percentages into actual numbers, 15 formula grantees have spent 100% of their CARES Act funds and seven competitive grantees have. So um, a few important reminders here. The period of performance for the CARES Act funds is three years beginning on the date that the grant agreement with HUD is signed. And as uh, Amy alluded to, grantees will not be able to extend that performance period or repurpose those funds for other uh, activities. So be aware of that. The funds are intended to be spent at the rate you need to spend them. There's no real, there's no requirement to spread them equally or in any specific way across three years, but should be based on, on what the local need is. FY20 funds that were designated for COVID-19 response in your annual action plan cannot be utilized or drawn until all HOPWA CARES Act funds are spent. Um, that's a, an important element for you to be aware of. And uh, HOPWA CARES Act funds, when they're available, should be the priority for use when serving uh, HOPWA eligible households versus other CV funding. If you have not yet done so, we recommend that grantees meet internally and also with their project sponsors to consider it, it if you are showing as, as underspent or slow spending to consider um, why that's happening. The, these are just some of the kinds of questions that you should ask in those sessions. Are there um, contractor reimbursement delays? Um, is that something that needs to be paid attention to? Is there confusion about what activities and costs are allowed with CARES Act funding? If that's true, then these questions can be quickly answered through the HAPA Ask a Question desk and technical assistance is also available at any time to help with those kinds of concerns. We hear from people that there are um, concerns about documentation and some misconceptions about that. One common misconception we've heard from providers is that they think that a direct personal link to COVID-19 must be documented for each individual client in order to be able to utilize CARES Act, Act funds for um, activities for that person. This is not true. It's only necessary to show that CARES Act funds are being utilized for HOPA clients overall to help with um, the challenges caused by COVID-19 in the community. Also, is there a local push to spend other CV funds first? We know that this has happened in many cases because of deadlines that other programs have set. 
this is an issue that that grantees and sponsors need to address as needed based on what's happening among funders uh, in the community. And also, you may need to ask if funds are slow to be spent due to sponsor staffing shortages. That is something that has been brought up to us as well. Remember that CV funds may be used to add staff positions when needed, and this may be something also to look at. And okay. at this point, I'm gonna ask Emily to talk a little bit about um, this from the IDIS perspective. Thank you, Crystal. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Emily Fishbein, and we're glad that you are here with us today. I'll be talking briefly about several HAPWA IDIS reports and how they can be helpful in tracking your spending. First, I just kind of want to reiterate what Crystal said. An important thing to remember is that in order for these IDS reports to be a useful tool for tracking your spending, your internal accounting and reimbursement processes should be allowing for timely and regular draws from IDIS. So you'll want to ensure that you are receiving invoices from your sponsors regularly, that you're reviewing and processing these invoices regularly and reimbursing your sponsors regularly. Now, we all know that it's often difficult for nonprofit organizations to float their funds. So the sooner you're able to reimburse them for their expenditures, the better. And then don't forget to reimburse yourselves through IDIS. Again, IDIS expenditures are the only way that HUD is able to tell if you're actually spending your CV funds. If you find that you're not able to reimburse your sponsors regularly and not able to draw regularly, <clears throat> excuse me, you may want to review the flow of your invoices, your processes, and talk with your finance department if needed to adjust your processes so that you can ensure a timely flow of invoices and funds. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk a bit about reports. In order to access your reports, log into your IDS account and click on the reports tab that you'll see at the top right corner of your screen. You may be taken straight into your reports, or you may have to scroll through, click on a few folders first in order to get to your Hopwood reports, depending on your IDS account permissions. So how can these reports help you track your spending? The reports that I'll be talking about will be the PRO1, the PRO2, and the PRO5. So the PRO1 report will list all your HAPWA allocations and indicate the amount committed to activities, the amount available to commit, the amounts drawn, and the amounts available to draw, among other information. This report is helpful in viewing all of your grant balances at one time. The PRO2 report shows your IJS activities by program year, by project, and by activity. And it's useful in determining how much funding in your projects has been drawn, what your remaining balance is, and which activities the balances are in. PRO2 is very helpful as a snapshot of your HOPWA program budget status. The PRO5 report shows you all the HOPWA vouchers that have been successfully completed during a time frame that you determine when creating the report. It is useful for searching for information about completed vouchers or searching for draws by date. The PRO5 also includes the approximate cost incurred date field, which you indicate when you're creating a voucher. This field allows grants to be linked with the date the grant funds are spent, not just drawn which is especially helpful regarding funds drawn after the end of a program year. Remember, when you click on a particular report, be sure to complete all the fields required in order to run the report. Several grantees have not yet set up their HOPWF CV funds in IGIS. If you find that you're having trouble setting up your funds, there's a special guide on the screen here, which will walk you through setup for CARES Act funds. Um, in addition, you can also ask HAPWA IDIS questions anytime through the HAPWA Ask a Question portal, or you can request TA through the HUD Exchange program support. Back to you, Crystal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kate. So um, when looking at your budgets and spending strategies, 
it's going to be important not to just look at CARES Act funds, although that is at the top of our of a HUD's list of concerns, but also other available or anticipated HOPA balances. The first, obviously, is your HOPA CV balance. Once you've determined whether the IDIS balances that um, Emily talked about are correct, or you've adjusted them based on what's been expended but not yet drawn in IDIS. Um, the second is uh, FY20 designated funds. What, what was set aside specifically in the annual action plan for COVID-19 response um, and looking at what the, the balance is there that you would have available going forward once your CARES Act funds have been spent. And last, your projected FY22 allocations. So modernization of the HOPA formula has changed the allocation level for some grantees. And as we're nearing the end of a stop loss period that we'll explain for modernization, all grantees will see changes in their allocation levels beginning with FY22. And many of those will see significant increases. Um, OHH will give you a brief update on that in just a moment. This is a reminder um, that the option to designate FY20 funds to COVID-19 is still available. Um, there are advantages and or benefits to doing this when there's a community need um, um, for additional funds because those funds if you're using the FY20 funds through your AAP, uh, the grantee and sponsors will receive the same benefits when using those funds uh, as CARES Act funds, including higher admin costs, uh, STRMU at 24 months and so forth. But we do need to point out that grantees amending their annual action plans at this time must follow all of the normal con plan requirements for citizen participation and public comment, the public comment period, um, because the waivers that shortened those in the beginning in 2020, um, when this effort started, those waivers have er, expired at the end of the year. So um, be aware of that as well. As we mentioned a few minutes ago, um, new FY22 HAPA allocation projections based on the modernized formula and federal budget projections are being sent out to all grantees. Some of you may have already received those. So I wanna turn this over to Rita Harcrow to explain further um, how this is working. Hi, thanks, Crystal. Um, yes, everybody should have, uh, all, all formula grantees should have received those dated FY22 projections uh, earlier this month. And I hope that everyone is taking time to review those and your communities uh, look at uh, planning around those changes that could happen with your local awards um, this year with your FY22 funds. Overall, like Crystal mentioned, there is a real anticipation that allocations will increase. But until we have that FY22 budget uh, passed, uh, we won't know the final information uh, on that. So the projection sheets are really a, a planning tool for you to forecast and, and look ahead for what could be happening locally with your HOPWA formula awards. Um, if you haven't received your, your uh, projection sheets this month uh, for grantees, or if you have questions uh, about those projection sheets, I hope that you'll reach out to the AAQ, the HOPWA Ask a Question desk, uh, to let us know. And also feel free uh, to, to request technical assistance if you have questions about how to plan around what it is that you're seeing there in those projection sheets. And the reason we're mentioning this, uh, these mod changes again here in this uh, uh, CARES Act spending webinar is in light of the need to consider plans uh, for the possibility of an influx of money into a community for HOPWA formula while we're also making plans on how to appropriately and timely spin down those CARES Act awards. 
uh, and, and make sure that we're not just putting the CARES Act money aside to focus on uh, the modernization of the formula and those increases or vice versa. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide is really uh, just an overview, a reminder of the key points of HAPWA formula modernization. Um, in the Housing Opportunity Through Modernization Act, or HOTMA, updated the HOPWA statute to base eligibility for formula funding and grant amounts on people living with HIV instead of those cumulative AIDS cases. And the use of that data point started with the FY 2017 allocation. HOTMA also removed the previous requirements that 25% of formula funds would be distributed to metropolitan areas based on an above average per capita incidence of AIDS. So that is what we call the POT25. And that POT25 or bonus funding under the prior formula was only for metropolitan areas. And so states could not receive any funds from that 25% pot of the HOPWA formula dollars. When HOP, HOPMA updated the HOPWA formula to remove the bonus funding, um, it replaced it with a requirement that 25% of formula funds would be distributed based on local housing costs and poverty rates. So under the new formula, all formula grantees receive funds under the 25% pot based on those factors, not just the metropolitan areas. The law also provided that uh, the, the modernized formula would be phased in over a five year period. And that was to avoid those volatile shifts from year to year in either directions, uh, either direction for any jurisdiction. HOTMA included provisions that said during the five-year phase-ins, uh, phase-in period, jurisdictions would not gain more than 10% or lose more than 5% of their share of the total available, that jurisdiction based on the previous year. So we would run the formula and then we would run this other uh, uh, formula to make sure that we were maintaining that stop loss or that five or 10% of the share uh, requirement. Um, so again, those caps were provided just to give communities uh, time to adjust, time to plan over the five years so we could avoid those volatile shifts in any direction. But it didn't exactly happen uh, that way. Uh, so uh, what's happened over the past five years, um, Congress has been approving uh, HOP, a HOPWA appropriation at a funding level that allowed all formula grantees to remain relatively whole or gain. So over the course of the phase in, uh, most grantees have seen an increase already um, and, and the rest have either stayed the same or received minor cuts. So we don't know in FY22 uh, exactly what will happen when the stop loss ends, but all indications and, and the numbers that we've seen so far uh, mean that, uh, show us that there will continue to be uh, an increase in the HOPWA appropriation. And that means your local allocations could change significantly. So even though we planned early on in 2017 for potential losses, we really now are looking through this lens of remaining level or gaining significantly in many cases. And again, that's why we're mentioning it here in this webinar. So as you're looking at your CARES Act funds remaining, how to appropriately spend down that money, that you can also look at those possible impacts of the HOPWA formula modernization changes. So this is a really high level overview of modernization. There's a lot more information out there, especially if you're new to HOPWA. Uh, you, can, you can go to the website that's linked here. Uh, there's a, a, a landing page that, that has all our HOPWA formula modernization resources. Uh, and as always, if you have questions or concerns, please reach out to us through the AAQ. And now I'm going to turn it back over to you, Crystal. Thank you, Rita. So, um, I mean, you could see from adding in these new projections and looking at um, your CARES Act funds and where they are right now, that what this is basically turned into is an exercise in um, budgeting and 
doing budget projections going forward, um, considering all of those funds available, whether they are CARES Act, other unspent funds, um, future allocations, uh, that all has to be known for you to be able to start to project costs based on the activities you've determined are, are most needed in your community. We know that costs can generally uh, be considered committed or flexible costs based on um, uh, whether they are recurring or represent multi-year costs for housing such as TBRA and others. Um, and if you go to the next slide, these are just some examples of committed costs to keep in mind on uh, tenant-based. Uh, and generally that means that it is not easy to start and stop these kinds of funds because they project out um, longer term in many ways or more difficult to, um, to cut back, including tenant-based rental assistance, uh, the permanent housing placement uh, funds that are being used directly in connection with your TBRA implementation. Also operating or leasing facility-based housing, including master leasing programs, capital development, of course, and some supportive services, especially when those services are directly connected with the delivery of housing, such as uh, case management and, and other things that help you, you know, in the implementation of housing. And some of the more dynamic or flexible cost examples uh, include, include STIRMU to some extent, um, permanent housing placement for non-TBRA households. There are many grantees who, uh, in addition to using PHP to support their TBRA programs, use a, a good portion of those funds to help people um, with the cost of getting into market rate housing that they're able to afford. Um, but that is something that can be uh, a, adjusted more easily than when it's connected with your TBRA. Also housing information services, resource ID, uh, and some, some supportive services that may be easier to um, increase and decrease such as food and transportation um, and different kinds of things. So it's very individual on an individual basis because it depends upon what the needs in your community are for sure. These are some strategies that you can use to set the stage for developing the kind of budget projections we've been talking about. It will definitely be important to reassess your existing needs related to COVID-19 um, using both qualitative and quantitative data to identify gaps and priority needs. This can also help you identify activity adjustments that are needed for CARES Act funds, FY20 designated funds, as well as any of your regular HAPA allocations. A major goal here is to determine whether the priority housing needs for HAPA has changed. Is there a need to shift funds to meet the highest needs or to leverage other resources outside of HAPA? For example, if all of the your CARES Act STIRMU funds have been expended, but this remains a very high need in your community. You may need to consider shifting more funds to STIRMU. As another example, if your program is seeing a continued high need for hotel motel vouchers or hotel motel rooms, you may want to um, leverage that activity from other community resources as it's one that is covered by uh, many other programs as well. It will also be important to include projections for permanent housing costs, such as TBRA, moving forward to ensure that you have sufficient funds available to maintain that level of housing going forward. And remember that for formula grantees, no HUD approval is needed to shift activity funding uh, unless you're adding a new activity that's not in your con uh, or action plans. Again, make sure that you're taking all HAPA funding sources into consideration when projecting budgets over the next uh, one to three years. HAPA CARES Act funds are clearly top priority, FY20 funds, 
after that, regular HAPA allocation balances from any year and your projected FY22 funding. Um, and, and especially if you are uh, in the category of uh, expecting to receive significant additional funds um, than in previous years. Just a reminder that um, many program design adjustments can be made through uh, just budget revisions. Formula grantees can revise budgets without HUD approval, as long as the activities are in their plan, as we, as we said. Competitive grantees have somewhat less flexibility with that, but may work with HUD to approve budget revisions that may be needed. And if any grantees, if any of you are having difficulty in spending funds or have questions about this, they can, uh, you can request technical assistance um, on, through this link on the HUD exchange. For grantees who've spent most or all of their CARES Act funds, these are some steps to keep in mind. Um, project the use of other HAPA funds to help address any continuing pandemic related needs for HAPA households. As Rita mentioned and other people have, you know, we don't know how long a lot of these issues are going to continue to be um, primary in our communities. So that is something you really have to project making budget changes as funds decrease and, and or your priorities change and uh, move the money to where those activities are most needed. And as always, increasing collaborations to work with um, other entities within the community to leverage funding for HAPA eligible households will continue to be important. For grantees who are underspent, uh, on CARES Act funds. It's going to be important to determine your exact CV balances and spending rates, take a look at those, address any roadblocks to spending CARES Act fundings uh, and delivering housing and service activities. Um, and that is something that is best done in communication with your project sponsors, grantees. Um, increasing collaboration with other systems of care uh, and making those budget changes needed to move funds to activities that address the highest needs uh, and can be spent without delay. I think one of the most challenging factors about uh, COVID-19 is that conditions, concerns, and health recommendations are constantly changing. Given that situation, these are some additional questions um, to use, to address in your, your, your interim kind of planning process that we're talking about here. Um, you know, keeping up with what the current local health and safety recommendations are um, and whether that information is being um, uh, shared with staff and clients. Asking is our approach to sharing information with HAPA, with the households we're serving um, on anything, on safety, vaccine services, is it comprehensive? Is it equitable? Are we sure that we're, we're getting information out to everyone uh, in an equal way? And really have the priority housing needs for HAPA changed in our community? Is, is there a need to shift funds to meet those highest needs? And finally, uh, are we spending HAPA CARES funding at the needed pace? And if not, again, as we keep saying, take a look at what some of the roadblocks might be um, that could be addressed. And finally, these are some key items to keep in mind as you re revisit your client support and care efforts and priorities during the pandemic. The link provided here to a responding to COVID-19 surges resource guide will provide you with additional guidance and suggestions for updated program processes, including the ones that were, were highlighted most uh, in that document and in a previous webinar. And that's to make sure that housing security is the top program priority to also increase client outreach and engagement, which is so needed during um, very difficult times of COVID-19. 
to continue to provide safety education and PPE. There was a real push for that in the beginning. And if that's something that's fallen off, given where we are with the pandemic right now, that may need to be revisited. And to educate client households and staff on vaccines uh, and testing and where they can go for testing. And with that, I'm going to give it back to you, Kate, um, to finish up. Well, bring it on home. Thanks, Crystal. Yeah. Um, so as always, we are here to help. You can get answers to your questions through the HOPWA Ask a Question portal on the HUD Exchange. And as has been said multiple times, if you require more in-depth support regarding your COVID-19 planning, program development, and problem solving, you can submit an online TA request also through the HUD Exchange. And make sure you don't miss HOPWA guidance and resources related to COVID-19. Uh, be sure to periodically check out the COVID-19 resources on the HUD Exchange and HUD.gov. And also to be sure that you're signed up for the HOPWA mailing list on both the HUD Exchange and HUD.gov. And now we are happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Kate, Crystal, and Emily and team. We do have some questions. Um, Crystal, during the program design section, you mentioned dynamic, flexible costs. Can you provide some examples? Yes, and I think that the slides uh, did give some of that. Um, as I dig for it. So the ones that were more flexible, Short-term rent, mortgage, and utility. Start, yes, and what we were talking about were things that um, were a little easier to stop and start in terms of the level of services being provided. Um, uh, Sturmu, for sure, is more flexible to stop and start than TBRA would be, right? Because TBRA is, is permanent housing and... Um, um, and goes uh, over time. Um, some supportive services um, are more flexible. PHP, if you are using it, um, not just for your TBRA, but for other people in the community. Um, and, and it's going to be different for everybody, but looking, you know, I think that, that each community can look at you know, how they can stop and, or, you know, what is more flexible given what they've decided they really need the most. Thank you, Em. Okay, um, thanks, Christine. What is the HOPWA CV spending deadline? Mm -hmm answer that. Um, so all HOPWA grants have a three-year period of performance. So the period of performance for your CV grant started uh, when you, as the grantee, signed the grant agreement and it ends three years later. So every grantee's period of performance is going to be slightly different, um, but uh, it's all a, every HOPWA grant is a three-year period. Thanks, Thank Amy. Um, the HAPA FMR waiver is ending on March 31st, 2022. There's no indication with, with the housing market that, there, that the rents will get adjusted. Are there any plans to continue to receive the assistance or any assistance around FMR? So when those waivers um, expire at the uh, end of March, the... Um, in that waiver memorandum, it stated that um, in the future, there won't be similar blanket waivers, but that communities can request waivers um, of HOPWA regulations um, really at any time. So that will be an option. Um, but I will also plug as far as sort of phasing out um, the rent standard waiver, um, that will be, that has been discussed in a few different places. I can put a link, um, in the chat to the webinar that we had, I believe it was in the fall, uh, uh, specifically around phasing out um, waivers that has helpful information and strategies in there for 
returning to the um, old rent standard after the waivers have expired. There's also a session um, this afternoon on HOPWA property standards and rent standards waivers um, that I encourage you to um, tune into. And then we are also planning in mid-February a uh, webinar or office hours um, uh, type presentation uh, specifically on um, the rent standards waiver and, um, and phasing that out. And so that will be promoted through the HUD exchange and the HOPWA, um, the HUD exchange HOPWA mailing list and the HUD.gov HOPWA mailing list. So if you're not signed up for those, um, I definitely encourage you to do so. And just to alleviate any real nervousness on the part of people who see that 331-22 end date, again, that does not mean that everybody who is above the FMR and using that waiver has to immediately move or change their residence. There, as, uh, as Amy mentioned, there are uh, a number of options that people have, including waiting until the second anniversary of that lease signing um, and other kinds of processes that you can go through so that people would not be displaced immediately. Thank you, Amy and Crystal. Um, okay. I believe this one was answered to the requester, but we may as well go ahead and ask it uh, aloud so that everybody hears the answer. Does a physical inspection for lead still need to be conducted if a grantee takes advantage of the inspection waivers? The guidance has been that those inspections can happen virtually um, as well uh, for HOPWA. And I also encourage you to um, participate in the HOPWA property standards and rent standards waiver um, session this afternoon that we'll be talking more about the property standards waiver. Thanks, Amy. Um, staffing shortages are a problem for several of our sponsors. Can you provide some examples of how CV dollars can support staffing needs? We don't usually add staff with funding sources that are not recurring. Um, I can try to take a stab at that one. Uh, having been a grantee before, I know that's a little unnerving to uh, know that you have a deadline looming where grant uh, funds will not be renewed. Um, but you could look at something like a term hire where it's, uh, there's a set beginning and ending date um, or um, part time, uh, what, whatever you, your need is, as long as there is an understanding of how you can support that uh, work later. Um, and of, of course you would look at what your line items are where you've got uh, funds remaining and see if that makes sense to uh, pay those costs. And that's what the, the staff need is, is delivering, you know, say uh, you have that in uh, tenant-based rental assistance, or are you going to have someone assisting with that on, on the short term uh, to help you uh, get those funds expended uh, appropriately? And, um, and there's extra work associated with delivering services during a pandemic as well. So those are my initial thoughts. Others may want to chime in on any thoughts you have. If, if anyone else is chiming into that one, um, I'll go ahead and ask another question that's come in. If funds can be used to purchase gift cards, how, are the, how should those funds be documented? There has been some guidance put out on this um, that can be found in some of the uh, other previous webinars. Gift cards, the, the main thing with gift cards is uh, you know, making sure that they are secure and that you keep a record of um, the numbers of all of the cards who and, and when they are checked out, who they go to. Um, you know, anything that can, you know, any process that you set up like that internally needs to be part of policies and procedures and needs to take extra care for these kinds of things that, that essentially are, are equate to cash. 
So it'd be just be very careful with making sure that you have internal documentation procedures in place. Thanks. Thanks. And I have um, a, a plug for a document on the HUD exchange around that. There's a get the facts for supportive services on the COVID-19 um, page of the HUD exchange for HOPWA. So folks can, uh, if they need it in writing or want to see that also in writing, um, that is one place they can go for that. Thank you so much for that. Um, Rita, earlier you referred to a letter. Um, was that the projection sheets that you were referring to? Yes. Um, so projection sheets were uh, transmitted um, by email. Most of them went out earlier in January. There were a few that may have gone out in late December. Uh, but yeah, so it, what I was talking about was really the local um, EMSA or state uh, projection sheets. So um, those should have all been received by now. Thanks, Rita. Okay. Um, our housing market is really tight. So we've been putting clients into motels until we can get them housed. Now that the time limits for short-term housing facilities waiver has expired, do we have any recourse if we aren't able to house a client within that 60 day period? So I can take that question. Um, so hotel and motel stays aren't actually subject to the same statutory and regulatory time limits that short-term facilities are subject to. Um, although HOPWA program guidance has generally been that hotel and motel stays should be limited to no more than 60 days in a six month period. This could be extended um, on a case by case basis without a waiver um, as needed. And um, grantees and project sponsors should develop policies that detail how extensions can be approved and explain how the policy will be consistently implemented. Um, so basically the client may be allowed to receive more than 60 days of hotel or motel assistance assuming that they meet all HOPWA eligibility criteria and um, a case management assessment demonstrates the need for additional temporary housing. Um, but you know, please remember that hotel and motel rooms are a temporary measure um, and programs must uh, develop housing plans for all clients focused on um, finding more permanent solutions. Thanks, Amy. Um, this question is, is related to an earlier conversation. Um, with the extension of the FMR rent standard waiver, does that mean a client can lease up a unit that is above the FMR until March 31st? Hey, Christine. So the answer to that is yes. And that's assuming that the grantee has notified the field office that they intend to use the waiver. Um, and also, uh, making sure that the, the unit passes a, a rent reasonableness uh, standard or that review process. Um, so in short, yes, if it's February 15th, you can lease up uh, right up until the first. So if that's the question is, is how long do you really have? Can it go down to the wire? Uh, just make sure that you're following those requirements of notifying the field office and the rent reasonableness. And I would also want to plug, this has been mentioned before, but this afternoon, there is another uh, session um, that will focus uh, more closely on some of these topics and uh, hopefully get a little more information out to you about what uh, written reasonableness means. Thank you, Rita. Okay, we are a competitive grantee and we added some new budget line items with our CARES Act funds. We've now spent all our CARES Act funds, but our clients are still facing challenges and could benefit from new budget line items. Is there a chance we can get more CARES Act funds? If not, can we request a budget modification to add those line items to our existing grant? Um, so first I wanna clarify that there, you know, there won't be additional CARES Act funding um, going to formula or competitive uh, grantees. Uh, but there are a few things um, that I can mention. So competitive permanent supportive housing um, grantees 
can submit budget amendment requests, um, but they must wait until the beginning of their second program year to request the amendment. Um, and you know, all amendments must be justified based on clients and, and the needs in um, the grantees community. Um, also, starting with last year's renewal process, um, instead of being required to renew existing permanent supportive housing projects, um, grantees actually had the option to propose replacement program designs and activities um, that better address the current needs in their community. And so we are expecting that same um, flexibility to continue um, in future years through appropriations language. Um, so if you are a competitive grantee that is eligible for renewal in the coming year or so, this um, replacement option may be something that you want to uh, consider. Um, and then just another thing that I think is worth mentioning is that, um, you know, there's been an abundance of new rental assistance resources in communities across the country um, through the American Rescue Plan and a whole host of other housing programs that received CARES Act funding and other sources. And so we strongly encourage you to tap into other non hopple resources to meet the needs of people living with HIV in your community whenever possible. Thanks, Amy. Um, just to clarify, if my community designated FY 2020 funds for COVID response, the same benefits and flexibilities as the CARE Act fund, funding still applies, even the admin amount? Yes, it does. So um, if under your formula award, uh, you've amended, uh, so you've spent your CARES Act money and now you've amended your FY20 regular HOPWA formula award so that a portion of it can be designated for a COVID response, then yes, uh, those uh, same provisions will apply. So those flexibilities apply. And that includes your admin and uh, storm you up to 24 months. Thanks, Rita. Um, okay, we, we received our projections, but when will we know what our actual FY22 award is? Um, so I can take that one. And so we uh, developed projections both, uh, based on the Senate um, and the House's proposed budget amounts. Um, and, but we won't know exactly how much funding jurisdictions will receive until the federal budget is passed by Congress. So until Congress passes um, appropriations for the HOPA program. Uh, right now, we are under a continuing resolution uh, through February 18th. So we most likely won't know what um, the HOPA appropriations will be until at least then. Uh, thank, thank you, Amy. Um, we are getting a lot of pressure locally to spend out the ESG CARES Act funds first before we spend our HOPWA dollars. Can we get an extension for the HOPWA CARES Act? So no, don't, don't plan on that. Um, it, CARES Act was um, designated as emergency funding at the you know, it's right there in the name of the act. So it's anticipated that those funds would be used immediately for emergency needs. Um, so it's a three year fixed period of performance. You have the three years uh, to spend it. And we do understand that there's a lot of new resources coming into communities um, that need to be spent. Um, and we're all under that same kind of uh, pressure. Um, but in, unless there's a really unusual circumstance, this is not something that we'll be able to issue an extension. Thank you, Rita. Well, we received a new question and um, I'm not sure if, um, well, I'll just let you take it. An ESG CV presenter yesterday alluded to lead safety regulations being unchanged for ESG despite the inspection waivers. Can you explain why there's a perceived difference for HAPWA? I'll, 
I'll just say, I'm not sure what was presented yesterday. If there's something new, um, that is not the guidance that we've been uh, issuing now. Um, so um, like all things related to the pandemic, uh, there's a possibility that things change. So we'll certainly look into that, but right now our guidance has um, remained the same. Thanks, Rita. So, so um, I just wanna do a call out one more time to see if there are any other final questions. I'm not seeing any more questions. Is anybody else seeing any more questions? So I'm gonna to toss it to you, uh, Kate. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, this concludes our session on Hopwa Spendown. Enjoy the rest of the conference.